Hello everyone! In this video, we will be going through the purpose, elements and different types of curriculum design, mainly to focus on how we may organize the curriculum of a module, a course or that of an entire program. So we will focus on the purpose and the elements that make up the curriculum. The curriculum on paper will have mainly two components, and these are the contents and on the other hand the structure, that is, how the curriculum will be organized to deliver these contents. Defining both components is an arduous task and it is often difficult to reach an agreement. Now, the document that is generated, regardless of the area of knowledge or discipline on which it is focused, must meet four purposes. The first is to communicate to the students exactly what they should expect from the curriculum, including the support available for them and resources. In second place, it must guide teachers on what to do to deliver the proposed content and support students in aspects of personal and professional development. The third purpose is to establish appropriate strategies to assess student learning and also establish relevant implementation of measures to evaluate the effectiveness of the teaching delivered. And it should also communicate to society how the faculty, school or the program is meeting its social responsibility. The curriculum then must present a global image of the discipline to be studied, define the teaching and learning processes and the expected learning outcomes. However, all decisions must be made based on the statement of its vision, mission and values intended by the curriculum, without neglecting that this statement must be contextualized to the local setting. Now we're going to see some steps and general concepts for curriculum design. It may not be within the specific role that you have in your workplace or faculty to design the curriculum. However, we all must know these general concepts in relation to how the curriculum is designed, so to have a better understanding of the study program in which we participate. Within all the lines of work and authors who propose how to design curriculum, there is a general agreement that the design must answer four questions. All these questions are now specifically focused on the educational program. What is its purpose? How will it be organized? What experiences will make sure that this purpose is accomplished? And how can we evaluate whether or not these purposes have been met? Those in charge of curriculum design must then answer these questions. And as we have already seen in a previous video, there are a series of factors that influence curriculum design that must be considered. When starting to organize a curriculum from scratch, it is common to think that one should start by defining the contents, the teaching and learning activities, the objectives of the educational program, its graduation profile, and finally, its mission and vision. However, the right way to do this it's quite the opposite, in the reverse order, and this is what it's called a retrospective curricular design or backward design. I must emphasize that here we are talking about curriculum design of a whole program, or at least a module, and not the design of a single session, though many principles do apply. Then the first step is quite simple, and is to define the type of educational program that we will develop. Then it is necessary to establish a statement of the purpose of the curriculum in terms of its vision and mission. The third step is to specify the intended goals, and this is related to defining the graduation profile with its learning outcomes, together with the learning outcomes of each phase of the curriculum that contributes to that graduation profile. The fourth step is to define the curricular structure or organization. What type of curriculum will be delivered? What are the contents and how will they be organized? Now the fifth stage is to define the educational experiences. How the learning results will be assessed in each course. What the learning strategies will be. The learning resources and in what context will the curriculum take place. To finally move on to the stage of how to evaluate the effectiveness of the curriculum. Is the curriculum being developed effectively or not? This is rather focused on quality control and quality assurance. 
We are, of course, seeing this way of curriculum design in a well-structured way. However, the stages that follow each other can occur in parallel, and the decisions in one stage may inform the others, and vice versa. How, then, is the overall purpose of the educational program expressed? This is expressed through the formulation of a mission statement for the educational program, expressing what the educational program intends to achieve now and in the short term, its reasons for being, and on the other hand, through the formulation of the program's vision, that is, what this educational program aspires to, what is its long-term goals, what's the ideal expectation. Within this statement of purposes, we find the general intentions, values, and characteristics of the curriculum. And once again, we must emphasize that this statement of purposes must be made considering the local context. Another relevant point to consider is how the curriculum may allow personalized options and designs to the context in which it is to be delivered. And as a result of this, the SPICES model has been proposed for quite some time now, which shows the options from a traditional curriculum to a curriculum with greater innovation. And here we have several points of reference. For example, from a more teacher-centered curriculum to a more student-centered one. From a curriculum that is more concerned with the collection and transfer of information to one based on problems, one based on disciplines or integrated, one focused more on hospital care or community care, a uniform or rigid curriculum, or one with a greater choice of electives. And finally, an opportunistic and based on the apprentice model or a systematized one where everyone should go through the same experiences. Now, we do not always have to be at one or the other end of these options. For some points, we can be more inclined towards the traditional curriculum or towards a more innovated one. This will depend again on the context in which the curriculum is designed. So what is the mission and vision of your programs? Now, regarding expected goals and the graduation profile, how can we describe these expected goals and what are they useful for? First, we need to set these goals and set the graduate profile and the learning outcomes of the course or modules. This is important since without these, we would not be able to define the contents of the courses and we would not have any guidance on what we should assess. So the reasons why the learning outcomes should be specified are mainly to inform students of what they need to achieve, inform teachers on what they should help their students achieve, to be the basis of the assessment system so that everyone knows what will be assessed, and to express the nature of the profession in which the student will be included and the professional characteristics that they must acquire. So the question to you again, how is the graduation profile and learning outcomes expressed in your programs? So once the purpose and expected outcomes have been defined, the curriculum must be written, showing how the contents will be organized, how the curriculum will be structured. So we will go through six different types of curriculum design, which in general are not mutually exclusive and may be combined. So let's start by looking at the linear curriculum. Here, the idea is simple. Contents are taught in a logical order. First, the things that need to be understood or known. This might include an anatomy session prior to injection techniques, for example. So ultimately, this design prescribes a rational step-by-step -step procedure. It is a sequential organization of elements that are key to this approach to curricular design. Then we have the subject-based curriculum which in some way represents the traditional and historical curriculum design. In this model of curriculum organization, the design revolves around a particular subject or discipline. There is little flexibility or cross-curricular activity. A core curriculum is an example of a subject-based curriculum. Subject-based curricula are useful for standardization across providers and professional regulatory bodies might have an interest in these types for obvious reasons. It also allows subject experts to be utilized in the learning process. Here, 
Each discipline represents an isolated silo, where there is no communication or interaction between disciplines, and many times it falls into repetition of content and in covering the same content with different criteria, where the most affected are the students. In this type of isolated curriculum, integration only happens inside the student's head. They have all the responsibility to make this integration between the contents. Now, as opposed to the subject-based or discipline-based curriculum, we have the integrated or coordinated curriculum. In the integrated curriculum, elements are tied together across disciplines. The contents are organized around an entity or systems, typical cases, for example, so that they are more closely related to real practice. The role of the teacher is to provide a logical connection across all the topics. This can be a much more fluid approach to organizing the curriculum. Take, for example, learning patient assessment. It may be that each system may be taught in a patient assessment module, rather than having separate anatomy and physiology modules. In such cases, communication skills, law and ethics, for example, are all tied together in a coordinated curriculum. This relies less on a specific subject expertise from teachers and more on understanding the themes being taught. In this case, that theme would be patient assessment. So the teacher would not necessarily be an expert in, for example, cardiology or neurology, but would have a thorough understanding of patient assessment and be able to draw relevant knowledge from the fields of cardiology and neurology into patient's assessment context. In general, we speak of two types of integration. The horizontal one integrates the different courses of the same year or phase of study. For example, the integration between different areas of basic sciences, anatomy and histology, for instance, while vertical integration integrates courses from different years or from different phases. An early patient contact approach is an example of vertical integration. However, integration is not black or white and can have different nuances or different degrees of integration, from isolated disciplines to total integration, and this will depend a lot on what we want to achieve. Secondly, we have the core and options type of organization, where we have the courses, contents, or central and compulsory areas that a student must pass and a series of options that a student can choose. It is not an easy task to choose what will be the core or central areas, and this has been a subject of controversy, especially in health professions education, where a student must acquire and master a wide range of knowledge, skills, and attitudes to be able to practice safely. However, this type of organization comes as a response to the great curriculum overload that our students face and can serve to decompress the curriculum. The options can represent different categories of basic sciences, extensions of certain core areas, laboratory work, social and community sciences, or education and management courses, for example. Then we have the spiral organization, which is based on students revisiting the material or contents at increasing levels of difficulty as they progress through the curriculum. So the spiral curriculum is predicated in Brunner's cognitive theory, which hypothesizes that you may teach anything provided that it is at the appropriate state of development. In this way, then, the themes and contents are revisited on a number of occasions. The level of difficulty increases, learning is directly related to what was previously seen, the previous spiral is essential for the one that follows. Here it is very important to emphasize that the spirals cannot represent repetition, but rather represent progress within the same content or area. This means that the spiral curriculum offers the benefits of learning by reinforcement. Logical progression is inherent to the process as the learner moves from simplistic to more complex ideas and the students are able to apply earlier ideas to later objectives. Finally, we have the modular organization, where each module represents a unit of study with its own learning outcomes, activities, and assessments. 
It is common for students to be taking more than one module at a time. This depends on the type of educational program. So going back to what we mentioned about how these ways of organizing the curriculum can be combined and are not mutually exclusive, an example might be an integrated curriculum with modular core content and student-selected module options, including content that will be revisited in different depth at different stages of the curriculum. So once again, to you now, so how is your curriculum organized? So once the contents have been defined and we know how they will be organized, we must define the experiences that students will go through. And specifically, we must define first the assessment system. What will be the blueprint to measure that learning outcomes are met? Then the learning and teaching strategies must be defined, including learning resources, feedback, and support for students. And here, there is no cooking recipe to follow, since different strategies can lead to similar results. There is no magic bullet, so it is also important to consider a range of strategies and to consider the ones that better align with your learning outcomes and assessments without forgetting the role of formative assessment as a learning resource. Then we must also consider the practical and clinical experiences, including the place where they will be conducted. What will be the focus of the curriculum? Community and primary care or hospital care? Or will it be a combination of both? At this stage, we should also consider the value of simulation and deliberate practice, planning that students may practice procedural and communication skills in a protected environment before practicing with patients and in situated contexts. And finally, how to ensure the effectiveness of the curriculum we have designed, how to control and ensure its quality. This is a step that cannot be ignored and must be constantly reviewed. This will determine the periodic curricular changes, whether minor or major, and here the vision of all those involved must be considered with respect to the curriculum on paper and how it is being put into action. The vision of students, teachers, employers, and the changes that may occur in the standards that govern our disciplines. So everything we have seen about curriculum design in this video is oriented towards the written curriculum, that planned curriculum that is documented and agreed upon by curriculum developers and teachers and that encompasses their intentions and aspirations. On the other hand, we have the curriculum in action or how the curriculum is actually delivered and this constitutes the reality that students are faced with. It is what happens in practice, which may or not occur differently or not as equal to what is expressed in the planned curriculum. To align the planned curriculum with the curriculum in action, it is essential to have the collaboration and commitment of educators. They have the power to put this planned curriculum into action or potentially, and sometimes unintentionally, to sabotage it. And finally, we have the curriculum as it is perceived by the students, how the curriculum is learned, and this represents the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that result from the learning experiences. And here we also find the hidden curriculum, which are the results that are not explicit on paper, which are mainly attitudes and beliefs fundamentally determined by the educational environment. And the hidden curriculum can sometimes get into conflict with the formal curriculum, especially in relation to professionalism and ethical aspects. For this reason, the main idea is to bridge the gap that exists between the ways of seeing and experiencing the curriculum, where the alignment of its parts and the commitment of those involved is key for success.